Hi everybody and welcome to this episode of the Psychology Book Club. Today we are having a slightly different format for this episode. It is just going to be Jake and I talking about the book The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. We did arrange this as a psychology book club but unfortunately very few people showed up so we're just going to be doing a little uh, run through of the book so that if you're listening to this and you haven't read the book yet you can hear about what it could possibly offer you um, and also hopefully make an informed decision about whether it's the kind of book that might be useful for you in your personal development journey and if you have read the book um, hopefully it'll be interesting to hear some of our thoughts about it um, and what we got out of it too so hi Jake hello thanks for joining me yeah thank you (laughs) well I thought we'd start where we always start which is general impressions about the book overall I quite like this book Um, definitely some things I wasn't such a fan of but I really like the fact and appreciated the fact that it's quite an easy read it's a very quick book and for the amount of words that are in the book I think you actually get quite a lot um, of information and a lot of really good stuff to walk away with another thing I really like about it is it's a very simple concept but I think a really powerful concept so the idea is that they're in general there are five love languages that everybody could potentially have Um, And just to run through what these are, these are words of affirmation, quality time, receiving gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. So the main gist of the book is that everybody has a dominant love language and problems in um, relationships, whether that's, I mean, he talks mostly in the book about romantic relationships, but I think in friendships and so on and familial relationships as well, problems arise when you are speaking a different love language to your partner or your friend or your family member. And so you're just kind of missing each other. So you might be thinking that you are showing them a lot of love and affection verbally and that's your way of expressing it to them but for them because their primary or dominant love language is for example acts of service um, they don't uh, receive your verbal affection as the sign of love and really what love is to them and the way that they love they love to be loved and the way that they show love to other people <clears throat> is through doing things for them. So that's the basic gist of the book. And like I said, you know, it's it's a really short, easy read, but it's a really powerful concept. And, you know, I was certainly reading it and thinking about my primary love language and your primary love language and thinking about, okay, you know, how can we use this in our relationship? So there was definitely a lot of actionable stuff there. Mm. What did you think about it? I think... I think the most the, the there's some good aspects to the book and some not not so good aspects. On the positive side, I think it's a really good book to get over a key message which I mean it sounds like a really simple one but it is just it's it is helpful which is just that um other people are going to have different preferences to you. Mm. And it's very much the same as the kind of many other psychology books that we've done. Like the Myers Briggs message is kind of the same message that you know everyone's different and people are going to respond differently to different things. And specifically within the context of a, a romantic relationship, a love relationship, he's making the point that don't just give love in the way that you think is the sort of nice thing to do but actually find out and understand what your partner wants. And, mm-hmm. I mean, that sounds like such a simple thing, but it, it is, it's, um, I mean, that's the most valuable thing that I found out uh, about this book is just to try and help you be conscious of thinking like, okay, well, what are the things that I want? What, what makes me feel loved? What are uh, things that I really appreciate? And then also to be conscious of thinking like, okay, well, that may not be the same for you. And I can really be conscious of like okay what's the things that my partner really appreciates and so forth Mm. and he has this whole sort of thing about everyone having a primary love language um so he's got basically a model that that he's describing which is you know that you identify which is your primary love language and you sort of use that and that's all fine i mean it's a model uh and as a model it has some of the um, limitations that any psychological model has um, I don't necessarily know that people just have like one primary love language and so forth, but I still found it really, really helpful, really useful. Um, and the other thing that I found really positive about the book was just it was nice to just have a list of ways to be loving. You know, he basically mm. provides uh, these five ways are just, you know, have you thought about 
words of affirmation and um, quality time and uh, gift giving um, and doing things, act equals acts of service, doing nice things for the other person, physical touch. And so it's quite um, a nice summary of lots of different ways that you can express love and that you can um, sort of act in a loving way towards your partner. So that was all cool. And I really, I, I found those things to be um, really good. As you said, very simple, straightforward. On the sort of not quite so helpful side, it is a very religious book. And it's, he's, there's a lot of stuff. He's, I think he might be a minister. I'm not. I think he's a pastor. Right, yeah. That stuff's not relevant for me. Um, I'm not religious. And I, I didn't really get any value out of, of that kind of, uh, some of the things that he said in there. And, and I think... That context also influences some of his ideas about forgiveness and various other things, which I don't think are really central to the book, and they're not, they don't detract from the overall book as being uh, helpful in the things that it's mainly talking about. But that wasn't, um, I wasn't really interested in that side of it. And, um, and I think in general, the, the whole, um, as I say, the fact that it's a psychological model of, of love is potentially a little bit limiting to sort of define everyone in terms of having their primary love language. I'm not sure that that's necessarily the case, but I do think it definitely, I mean, we've sort of, in talking about it, we've definitely realised that some things that um, are much more meaningful or impactful for me uh, in terms of signs of love are less impactful for you and, uh, and vice versa. And so, you know, in his terminology, you know, we... Uh, it's it helps it's helped us to think about what our so-called love languages are yeah absolutely because i um just on a personal note i totally did not know what your love language was until i read this book <laughs> and then it, i was reading it about acts of service which is your primary love language and it was like this light bulb moment for me <laughs> the uh, the light switched on and i remember sitting there having this real aha moment of oh that's that's why those things are so important to you mm. and really gaining a new understanding and appreciation of that. Um, I just want to come back to a couple of things you said. The first one about the simplicity again. It is a simple idea, but in some ways I think all the best ideas that we've looked at in the book club are simple ideas mm. that you can actually just take and immediately start using in your life. Um, and I think also the interesting thing about it is that as humans, I think we have a real tendency to have to see the world through our eyes and assume that everybody sees it through the same eyes that we see it. Yeah. And actually, this book is a really helpful reminder, not only in romantic relationships, but for life in general, that no, not everybody sees, in fact, probably no one sees the world in exactly the same way that you do. So it's really up to us to communicate what our preferences are and also to be curious and to listen to other people's preferences as well and he makes the point that love is ultimately a choice you know when you get into a relationship with someone you have this initial emotional high what some people call the honeymoon period but then after that the honeymoon period fades away and ultimately whether you stay and work on the relationship and you know learn each other's love languages um, or whether you end up letting the sort of differences come between you and break up, that is a choice mm. that you, you both have to make. And I really appreciate the fact that he, he highlights the fact that real love requires effort and discipline. Um, it's the choice to expend energy in an effort to benefit the other person, knowing that their life is enriched by your effort. And so knowing that, you, you will also feel satisfied. And I, I really appreciated that perspective because <clears throat> I think... You know, I don't know if it's just Disney that's responsible for this, this, but that was certainly what I was brought up on, this very stereotypical fairy tale view that you meet the one, your soulmate, and um, it's all easy breezy from there. Yeah, Whereas everything's actually, wine and roses from then on. Yeah, and any kind of conflict, any kind of disagreement or anything, that is a a sign of a potential storm brewing, and it's a, sign that, yeah, it's a sign that they're obviously not the one for you. Um, and that's a very kind of simplistic way of putting it, but I, I don't think I'm the only one there. In fact, I know a lot of people that I've talked to who have also had this mis this misbelief that, you know, if you if you are genuinely in love with someone, that means you don't fight and you don't have disagreements. Whereas actually, um, I can't remember who said this, and I've searched for it online high and low, but I, I honestly can't remember it. I think it was actually in one of the books that we read. <clears throat> um, but they said conflict is a function of interdependence. So in other words, if you are if you are interdependent with someone else, so if you're in an intimate relationship with them, 
you will have conflicts just because you have two different people with two different personalities, two different sets of needs, two different histories, um, two different, you know, I don't know, whatever, <clears throat> hopes and dreams for the future. Um, two people coming together and forming a life together, like, of course, of course, there are going to be conflicts. So I really, really appreciated him highlighting that and sort of demystifying that idea that <clears throat> love is easy because I don't think anyone finds it easy, frankly. <laughs> um, but at the same time, I think coming back to some of the issues that you raised, Jake, um, you know, I, I had a similar experience with the religiosity just because I'm also not religious. And I, I find with a lot of these books that generally um, a lot of personal development authors are religious or spiritual in some way. And I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I don't believe in any kind of God or sort of higher power or anything like that. Um, I wouldn't say I'm not spiritual 100% because I do meditate and things like that, but I don't believe that there is sort of any external energy or any God or anything like that. And so I think one of the one of the things that I, I try and do with this is to turn that around and say, okay, well, how does that fit into my framework of seeing the world? Um, so, for example, when other authors have talked about, you know, God, um, I have interpreted that as, you know, the sort of highest version of myself. Like, not this being that's outside of me, but almost like my unconscious. You know, the part of me that does know all the answers. It's just that sometimes I don't listen to it. Um, and that was one of the challenges with this book, was just finding a way to not just dismiss those parts entirely, but to almost try and use it. Reinterpret it. Yeah, reinterpret it in a way that is useful for me. Um, another thing that really struck me, uh, just because of previous books that we've done, and I think a lot because of a lot of the books we've done in the book club in general so far, is that... I'm not convinced that, you know, he, he presents this theory of the five love languages and he, the way he seems to portray it is that 99% of the time in marital um, conflicts and issues, the problem is that you're speaking the wrong love language. Personally, I don't think it's that simple. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, just speaking from personal experience as well, I found that your history and the beliefs that that's left you with, your upbringing... Um, you know, how your parents were and kind of what your, you know, the way your parents interacted and the expectations that you developed about relationships as a result of that and seeing other adults behave around you. I think that is just as, if not more important than what love language you speak. I think the love language you speak is super important for how you communicate with each other. But um, yeah, in my experience, I've also found that you need to be aware of what expectations and beliefs and struggles and challenges around relationships you are bringing forward because of your history and he totally doesn't touch on that at all mm, um yeah. at least i don't i don't remember him really even mentioning that so i guess my my one sort of major criticism was that um he I, I think that is really really important at least it has been to me and i think there's a real missed opportunity there to explore you know i would have really loved it if he had explored that in more detail as well or yeah. at least acknowledged that um because yeah, I'm not. I'm not convinced that it is just sim as simple as speaking the right language to each other. I think that's mm. a huge part of it, but I don't think that's the whole thing. Um, the other, the other thing that kind of surprised me actually was at one point in the book he talks about it's quite close to the end this idea that we all want to feel significant and that it's only by being in a relationship that we can meet that need. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. Um, but basically, we need to be in a relationship. You know, we all have this desire to be in a relationship with um, someone else because we want to feel significant. We want to feel secure. And being in a relationship meets that need. And there was something about the way he phrased it to me that just really made me sit back and think, I'm really not sure about that. I think there are other ways to get that too. And I'm very, I think because of, we've done nonviolent communication and books like mm. that. It's slightly jarred with me because there was very much the implication that like your partner meets that need for you. So maybe it sounded a bit like codependence? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, that's quite a... I, I, was, I was thinking of that word and I didn't want to use that word because it's quite a sort of dramatic word to use. But that was sort of what came... That was came, what came to mind for me, mm. for sure, was that it almost <clears throat> sounds a little bit codependent. Yeah. No, I just want to say, on, in terms of the things that you're saying, I do think that he... Uh, I know what you mean about him saying that um, basically the causable marital or relationship problems is people speaking different love languages and i think i totally agree with you that yeah there's a, there's a lot of opportunity for reducing misunderstandings 
by having more of an understanding of different ways to express love and how you might be speaking across purposes in, in that way. But I totally agree with you that there's a lot of other things that people have conflict over and that reducing all relationship conflict to a question of not learning the right love languages is, is, is a stretch. I, I thought so too. Mm. I think the most helpful thing maybe for people uh, is, you know, not to necessarily worry about this being his grand theory of everything that's going to fix a relationship because it's not right but in terms of what it is useful for there are lots of people who well everyone i think knows expressions of love that they would have seen their own parents um uh modeling like if their own parents were very you know very much focused on gift giving for example as the way that they expressed affection but but that they didn't show affection in other ways like they weren't physical and they didn't hug and that kind of stuff then this book could be really helpful to you know just help you think about different ways of of, of expressing love and different ways of, of showing love that you know if you didn't get it modeled in your childhood then you can see it in in this book mm, and um, also i think just generally in society you know there's very specific ideals about how you express love and what expressing love looks like mm. that doesn't really leave you with much room to be an individual and to have your own love language and i think this book is really good at raising my awareness certainly around okay well what is my love language and you know what can i do about this going forward yeah and i i think it's helpful just to you know, increase your ability to... Exp- I mean, it's, it's useful in terms of thinking about what your partner's primary love language is so that you can more closely, like, meet their needs. But also, like we were talking about, you know, all the love languages are nice, you know, yeah. they're all great. So it's not like, you know, uh, you only want to express love in one way. I think it's also nice to be able to um, express your love in, in all the different ways, both through... Uh, physical touch and through uh, quality time and through uh, acts of service and through all these other, all the other ones that he mentions you know so I think that's just um, a nice positive helpful sort of list of things to think about of different ways to be to be loving absolutely and going back to the example I used earlier to do with you know I, I think it was words of affection and acts of service it's not like if you give words of affection to someone and that's not their primary love language it's just going to go straight over their head you know they are going to appreciate it and acknowledge it and hopefully you know <laughs> one would hope anyway but I think the point that he makes is is that overall in the long term and the sort of um, the big picture view of a relationship Um, if your primary love language is acts of service and someone is giving you words of affection because that's their primary love language and that's how they express their love to you, those words of affection are not going to be as meaningful as Mm. acts of service over the long term. But they still, you know, they still are meaningful, but they're just not as meaningful as your primary love language. Yeah. Something else I really appreciated about this, which is similar to um, what he was saying about how love is a choice and it's something that requires effort and discipline. He also makes the point that um, some of the other books we've read about love and relationships have made, which is that real love can't begin until the in love experience has run its course, because it's when you come out of this honeymoon period and when the really kind of intense emotional highs and lows have worn off and the relationship is almost normalized i mean it's not his words that's sort of my interpretation of it but that's when you're really in relationship with each other because that's also when that choice starts to come in that choice of okay do i stay and work at this or do i do i leave Mm. um he also i'm just looking at my Uh, notes can i just say something to that as well because also i think the the difference between that um disney view that you were talking about and the 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 sort of real grounded relationship that happens after the so-called honeymoon period is that I think the the Disney view is that uh, you're just going to be so in love in a relationship that these um, expressions of your love, these acts of love are going to just like pour out of you and pour out of the other person. And any differences you have don't matter. (laughs) Yeah, naturally every day you'll just kind of like, you'll just be uh, really loving to each other. And I think the The point that he's making in this book, which is, I think, a a useful point, is it helps to really be conscious about being good to your partner and actually think about what you can do to, you know, to work hard for your happiness together. Mm -hmm. And you can actively, consciously make take steps to improve your relationship by doing things for the relationship, by being loving towards the other person. 
and yeah it, it happens spontaneously and you you are you do show love spontaneously but also it happens when you put work into it and when you actually think about what the other person what the other person's needs are and try and you know uh, be good to them basically mm. so i think it, that's the sort of difference between uh, the the romantic view of what a loving relationship is and you know the the sense that he's talking about in this book of a relationship which is also a conscious one yeah. you're actually making a conscious choice to be in a relationship with a person and to actually commit to it yeah another um distinction that he makes that i really um i found very interesting and i, I wrote down just because i think it really summed up for me the difference between these two things um, but he was talking about requests and relationships versus demands, um, you know, because quite often, or a lot of the examples that he gives in the book are people whose relationships have um, run run into trouble and basically one partner or both partners are making demands of each other. And the point that he makes is that a request creates the possibility for an expression of love, whereas a demand suffocates that possibility. And I thought that was a really powerful distinction. Mm. Um, that reminds me of that book... Um 10 truth skills yeah I think she talked about that as well in that book. Mm-hmm. yeah getting real sorry getting real yeah that's the one yeah so uh, just for people listening I thought um, just to finish up and obviously I'm happy to talk about anything else any other points that you have but just to finish I thought it would be interesting to share um, the clues to how to find out what your love language is because um, this was another thing that I really liked is that it, it was very practical. Mm. Um, it, you know, there's a lot of theory in there, but there was also a lot of really cool stuff that you can take away and start working with. So the questions that he offers that you can ask yourself if you want to work out um, what what your spouse's love language is, because I think it, the point that he makes is that you can usually tell what your love language is because you just think about sort of what you what kind of love you most Appreciate. appreciate receiving and also what love you give most often as well so is it words of affirmation is it quality time is it receiving gifts is it acts of service or is it physical touch um but when it comes to your partner or you know friend family member he says um look at their most frequent criticisms of you because the point that he makes is that criticisms are actually a plea for love mm. like obviously they're not particularly constructive in the sense that criticisms hurt and quite often they cause more conflict than they solve but actually criticisms there's information within the criticism that will help you decipher what your partner's love language is um and so one thing that he suggests saying is if you hear a criticism saying it sounds like that is extremely important for you can you explain why that's so crucial Mm. and i thought that was a really nice way of responding to criticism um because it's not easy to hear and it's really tempting to get defensive and kind of put up all these psychological barriers and defend yourself and everything um but actually i thought that was a really empathic um curious way of responding Mm. um and that really gets to the meat of the matter so that's the first question um and then the second question is what hurts you deeply um so when it's not present in the relationship what most what most hurts you deeply like if your partner withholds words of affection or if they don't touch you you know what like really cuts you to the core um and then what do you most desire as well like what would you like more from your partner i think these are actually questions to do with finding your own love language um i've got these a bit mixed up here um and it's the same thinking about it for your partner yeah absolutely so what really hurts them what do they most desire and then in terms of your own love language um what do you do for your spouse? So we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Like, what are yeah, your go-to you ways of expressing that? tend love? to express what you actually yeah. want. And mm-hmm. that, I think, is one of the most helpful things about the book is that it's you can learn that what you express as love is actually the kind of love that you want in return. But actually, the, what you need to do is to work out the kind of love that your the, the kinds of expressions of love that your partner really appreciates most. Yeah, and you can look at that by looking at how they actually express love to you and being also being aware that the way they express love to you, um, you might not necessarily see that immediately as an expression of love. Um, I mean, I hope you don't mind me using a personal example, but like last weekend, you replaced the hard drive in my laptop. <laughs> and before I read this book, I would have been like, wow, that's a really nice thing to do. But I wouldn't necessarily have 
seen it as an expression of love but having read this book and realized that actually your num your number one love language is acts of service that took on a whole new meaning for me and I was able to appreciate it at a much deeper level because it was like wow this is this is really an expression of love whereas before I don't think I would have necessarily you know I would have definitely appreciated it um but not I wouldn't have understood its significance mm. quite in the way that I did having read this book so that was nice That's thank you cool. for doing that <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so any final thoughts that you want to share about this book? Not really. It's, as I say, I think it's definitely helpful. Um, nice to have a list of different ways to be loving. Um, some limitations, but yeah, in general, uh, I got quite a lot out of it. Yeah, I agree. I would say that if you, if you are interested in having deeper and more connected communication in your relationships... Um, I would recommend reading this book. Mm. You might not find the whole thing completely relevant to you, but like I said, it's a pretty quick read. Um, it's not going to take a huge amount of time. And you get, um, in terms of sort of the amount of time you spend reading versus the amount of value you get out of it, it's uh, got a lot of bang for your buck. <laughs> so. Yeah, and I think it, just following on from what you said, I think it is really helpful if you are in a relationship to read these kinds of books and see you know, what you can, what you can learn from them. Another one that we, we read together was um, Harville Hendricks' book. Oh, Getting the Love You Want. Yeah. That was helpful. That was a it? lovely book, yeah. Really I would actually say that's more helpful than this book, yeah, just because I think it covers actually, a, lot more, a lot more ground. Yeah, it's, it's um, also it's a deeper book. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the Harville Hendricks' book is really good. Um, the Getting Real book is actually quite good for yeah. relationships too because it's about communication. And there's probably other ones that we've uh, we've read that I've forgotten that are also I think relevant the, for the other love related books we've done in the book club have been slightly more academic, academic yeah. and less practically. I don't think we haven't done getting the love you want. That's just a no. book that we read, but we could do that yeah, at some point. I think that would be interesting actually. Have to might have to reread it. To, yeah, I will um, totally have to reread it. <laughs> but if you want to read a good book for your relationship i would recommend number one would be the harville hendrix book getting the love you want and this kind of book the the one the love languages is good but it's more like a you know just another another potentially useful thing to read mm -hmm. cool well i think that's everything that we have to say about this so if you do read the book i really hope you enjoy it and thank you for listening. If you would like to join in any of the Psychology Book Club episodes that we are recording, we do usually do this as a recorded Skype conversation, you can go to facebook.com forward slash psychology book club, uh, where you'll find all the details about our coming book clubs and how you can take part. We would love to have you if you're interested. Um, the more the merrier, definitely. Um, although this has been nice. Yeah, it's been fun. It. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Jake. And thanks a lot for listening. Thank you.